Welcome back. We left the previous part in need of fresh air, because it was getting a bit stuffy with those bits and bites. Well, I hope you took a deep breath, cause there's more of that coming. But we'll have some fun with experiments too. We already saw that when you play on the microcork, MIDI messages are always sent out to its MIDI out port. We're gonna make that a visible, but first we will dig deeper into the lower level of communication to see how the messages are sent and received. As mentioned earlier, the bytes are transmitted one bit at a time. As an example, we take the first byte of a note on message on channel 7. Then the first nibble is a 9 and the second a 6. We convert 96 to binary. The bits will be transmitted in the 8N1 format, which means 8 data bits, no parity bit and one stop bit. Because there is no common clock signal, transmission is not synchronized and thus asynchronous. You may picture this as two people not having their watches set on the exact local time, but instead having two accurate stopwatches. Now we first flip the bits horizontally because they will be transmitted with the least significant bit first. Then we add a start bit, which is always zero, and a stop bit, which is always one. We pull up the output with a resistor to the 5V feeding line. At idle state, the output will now be 5V. We call that high. We may as well insert a LED or LED as an indicator light. At idle state, there is no voltage difference over the resistor and LED, meaning no current and LED off. This must change, otherwise the receiver does not know when the transmission has started. That's why the start bit must always be a zero because there is no visible difference between a 1-bit and idle state. After the start, the bits are distinguished by timing. At the moment the first bit, the start bit, is shifted out, the transmitter starts its stopwatch. Within a microsecond, the output opens to a low level. This will cause a current loop to run from the 5 volt feeding line through the resistor and the LED, which lights up, to the output of the transmitter which syncs it. We will indicate it in the first stages of the scheme by an arrow in the resistor. The receiver sees the LED burning and immediately starts its own stopwatch. It then counts out a half bit time, about 16 microseconds, before sampling the status of the LED to check if the start bit is valid or that it was just a voltage spike. Some systems even take more samples to make sure. If the bit is valid, counting continues. In the meantime, the transmitter is waiting for one full bit time, 32 microseconds, on its own stopwatch before launching the next bit. Because here the first data bit also happens to be a zero, nothing changes. Current loop and LED stay on. The receiver is taking away its own time, waiting for a full bit time, 32 microseconds after the last sample moment, so in total 48 microsec or one and a half bit time from the start to ensure it's sampling from the center of the bit, where it's most stable. And so it shifts in a zero for the first data bit. Then the transmitter sees on its clock its bit time again. Time for the second data bit, which is a one. That causes the output to pinch off. Level goes up, current stops, and the LED is off. So the input will shift in a one on the sample moment. And thus we go on. Until the stop bit is sent and sampled. If that's not a 1, then the receiver will report an error. Now we remove start and stop bit and flip the data bits back again. Then it converts to 96, which is correct. And in the same way, the two data bytes are sent shortly after this status byte. When we stretch it a little, it fits neatly on the real world signal captured by a digital scope. Hear the note off message. And there's that 4-0 dummy value for the velocity. Keep this in mind. The bits are transmitted using light. Only a zero will light up the LED. The power to drive the LED is provided by the transmitter's output only. At idle state, the receiver keeps waiting for the LED to turn on. LED off produces a 1, LED on a 0. In that way, 10 bits are registered after which the receiver reconstructs the byte and returns to waiting state. 
Now let's see how we can make the messages visible. A simple contraption can be made. I flip the port to look at the solder site. And there it is folks. I could have soldered it on a MIDI cable, but use a DIN connector to mimic a MIDI import. Ok, let's fire it up. Hmm, why is that LED on all the time? Did we do something wrong? No we didn't. Now we can see it, the MIDI clock of the microcork, the signals that we wrongly depicted in part 2a. On the default setting, somewhat confusingly called internal, these signals are continuously sent out, not only to the internal synthesizer, but also to the MIDI output. Fortunately it's much simpler than MIDI timecode or MTC, which is not used on the microcork. The MIDI clock is not an electronic clock signal, but a stream of F8 bytes. The microcork sends out F8 bytes as single byte messages to synchronize other synthesizers and for the timing of the arpeggiator. On the external setting the F8 bytes are not sent, but then the microcork is ready to receive them. To be synchronized to a master device, for example another synthesizer, a sequencer, or a MIDI clock device. And there are computer programs that can send them out. Messages with F in the high nibble are system messages and are interpreted regardless of the MIDI channel, so the low nibble carries no channel number. There are six real-time messages. Here I show you clock start, continue and stop. On the microcork continue is not implemented. Start and stop are not sent, but should be recognized upon receiving, if the clock is set to extern. Only the F8 clock message is both sent and recognized. Let's crank the F8 byte through our previous model to see what the signal looks like. Ok, flip the bits. And out comes a signal with a single down pulse that's 4 bits or 128 microseconds wide. We can see that on this old oscilloscope. When we zoom out, we see a pulse train, much like a real clock signal, but remember, each pulse is an F8 byte that will be interpreted by the receiving synthesizer. In this digital scope picture you see them as sharp needles. It's astonishing the LED is so bright with these short pulses. But the default setting they come out at almost 50 per second, which is double film speed, so too fast to see the separate flashes. Though the speed is quite steady, it is not fixed. It's not a real clock or stopwatch, but more a metronome. A ludicrous fast one that is. Let's rip the pulses from our scope and zoom out in this drawing. Normally clock messages go 24 in a quarter note. That's why they are also called pulses per quarter note or ticks. Thus one whole note or one common time measure will take 96 of those ticks. Some computer programs use a higher PPQN. They might send per quarter note 48 or 96 or even much more ticks. But we'll quickly forget that here to avoid confusion. Now for simplicity we say, as many musicians do, that one quarter note is one beat. So does this metronome. And so does the microcork, which counts 24 ticks of the ludicrous metronome for one normal metronome beat. A BPM of 120 will then have 120 quarter notes in a minute. How many ticks should be sent in that minute? That's easy. 24 times as much. Let's keep that number and look at the scope to see how the microcork is behaving. Hmm, I should have zoomed in here, but as a raw measurement 21 millisec per tick seems in order. The inverse in seconds multiplied by 60 gives... And that's close enough. Now I'll demonstrate that the MIDI clock changes with the beats per minute. Because the quarter note length varies in time of course. First we check the tempo to be 120 by selecting RPEG A with the edit select 2 dial and then turning knob 1. 
Next we turn knob 2 to select the quarter note resolution. We make the pulses audible by holding an unshielded audio input near my contraption. Now you can hear them at right and the notes at left. Because the MIDI clock bytes are real-time messages, they get priority over other messages, or at least, they should. In the normal traffic of MIDI messages, they won't disturb anything. But in the data flood of patch dumps to the microcork editor program, they do. They seem to rip the patch blocks. Or maybe they cause timing issues. The exact cause of the failure is still not clear to me. I did some experimenting. On the PC with the PC editor and MIDIOX, and on the Mac with the Mac editor and SizeX librarian. I collected two Shift 6 manual dumps in MIDIOX, one in external and one in internal mode. And save these as SizeX files. I will show you how to do that in part 2G. This is what I found out. Even on the internal setting, the microcarg does not send clock bytes during the long SISEC message that carries the data dump. Or at least I could not find any. Maybe this F8 byte interrupt I found years ago was just a rare glitch? However, the data dump on internal always misses a last fraction of about 1500 bytes. So it is ripped. But more like a document, torn off the printer before it's finished. The first 95% is delivered correctly, but then the clock bytes are coming back too soon, like impatient horses. The missing part has always exactly the same length. On the microcork, the total data dump is about 37,000, but 1552 bytes are not sent on internal mode. On the microcork S, the total dump is of course twice as large, so about 74,000, but here the last 1618 bytes are missing. These numbers are always the same, no matter how slow or fast I set the BPM and thus the MIDI clock. Here I compare the two files in HXD and indicated the start of the missing data block in blue. And because the terminating F7 byte is also in that last block, the PC editor does time out after waiting in vain for the end of the dump. And then it has to bring the frustrating message that we all know too well. On the Mac however, the data dump was complete on both the internal and external setting. And indeed, the Mac editor has no trouble with both MIDI clock settings. So it appears to be a PC related issue and we must not blame it on the PC editor. After clicking OK on the error message window, we often do see program icons, but these are the phony icons we met in part 2A. They are empty shells and do not contain the settings of the microcorx programs or patches as most people call them. So it seems the editor simply rejects the incomplete data dump. They all are identical and have untitled in their names, but when you just did a preload on a microcork, then the real programs are all untitled too. However, phony icons don't have the program number in parentheses after that untitled. They all contain the same empty settings, much like an initiated program, but not exactly the same. For example, the source fields in the four patches are empty and they all produce the same tinny sound. Again, much like, but not exactly like an initiated program. When we close the editor window, the PC editor tries again to receive the data dump from the MK, but as long as the clock setting is on internal, the clock bytes will keep coming back too soon. They also make our LED demo less clear, so to extern that clock setting. 
And now the LED turns off? No. What are these flashes then? Well, at the external setting, the microcork sends out FE bytes, about four times a second. This single byte message is grouped under the system real-time messages. However, its function is not timing, but something called active sensing. With this somewhat obsolete message, the microcork tells the connected devices it's still active and connected. And that's why it's only sent when there are no other messages on the line. Usually there's no need to send it, but, like a birthday card, after one active sensing message, the receiver expects them to keep coming in due time, forever. In our case, that is within the 300 milliseconds maximum of the MIDI standard. The microcork sends them out at intervals of about 265 milliseconds, which to me seems well chosen. And so its main function is preventing hanging notes when the line is disconnected. Allow me to show that it can do its thing on the microcork. First, we break the internal connection by selecting MIDI with the Edit Select 2 dial and then turning local to off with knob 2. Now the internal sound module doesn't play, but the keyboard sends out MIDI messages as always. You could play remotely on a second microcork without the sound of the first one, which of course is the main purpose of this local off setting. But let's do something funny. We connect the MIDI out to the MIDI in on the first, so the microcork is playing with itself, if you pardon the expression. We set the MIDI clock to in turn by turning top 3 and then, while playing a note, we'll pull out the plug. The synthesizer now misses the note off message and plays on. Even if we push the plug back in and play the same note again to generate a note off message, it keeps playing. Because now the new note on message misses a note off. Repeat the experiment with the clock set to extern. And now again the synthesizer doesn't receive the note off, but it also misses the active sensing messages and reacts by turning all notes off. What's the shape of the FE message on the MIDI cable? We crunch FE through our signal model and out comes a narrow down pulse, two bits wide, so that's 64 microseconds. On the old scope, and compared to the F8 clock byte. And on the digital scope, alternating with the MIDI clock F8 signal. And here, pasted together. These amazing devices can even decode the bytes. The signal on my microcork S appears somewhat tighter, but strangely, with the S, the LED on my contraption is not total dark between the pulses, as it is on my older microcork. Because it is only sent when nothing else is on the line, the auto-sensing message never interferes. Not even with the vulnerable long data dumps of the editor program. But though it is possible to see the note on messages and even more so the stream of messages from the both wheels on the LED, even between the MIDI clock bytes, this is not satisfying. We cannot filter them out on the microcork, so we let the excellent MIDI AUX program help us. Then we can block the real-time messages. After starting up, we first click this icon. In the then appearing windows, we drag the MIDI mapper to the window top right, if it isn't already there, and our input and output. Click OK and then the root icon. Right click. Disconnect all and then draw a connection between our input and output. 
In the monitor window we can see the system clock or active sensing messages. Now we're gonna block them out. Click the filter icon, then this dot and button, click all and OK. Clear the monitor window and now we are free of the real time messages. And the LED is dark between our note on and off messages. And thus the microcork sends its messages to a LED or LED that is viewed by the receiver. It's like rolling out a power cable to your neighbor's house and connect that to a lamp. Signaling the notes to be played. The eye of the receiver is in reality a phototransistor. And you will not see the light of the LED in your microcork because it is placed in a neat little black box, together with the phototransistor. It is called an optocoupler and it looks like a small IC with 4, 5, 6 or 8 pins. By using this setup, the circuits of sender and receiver are never really in contact. And that is a very wise protection against malfunctions or even circuit damages that are lurking, given the promiscuous character of the brand independent MIDI standard, which in fact is its very cause of existence. Though you can't see the LED in the optocoupler, you can have a visual on its light, if you have a MIDI adapter in your setup that has an indicator layer. Back to our setup to look at the pitch wheel. When it's turned, it sends a stream of messages. Why so many? That's an old story, but a quite long one too. So let's keep it for the next part, where we will also discover the fast variety of control messages when we give the modulation wheel a turn. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.